Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of FTC OnBot Java Shorts. My name is Hunter Cooperman, and I'm one of the programmers on the Penguineers. And today we're going to be talking about using classes and objects in your FTC code. So first of all, you know, what is a class and what is an object? Well, sometimes when you're programming your robot, you might run into a situation where you need to better organize certain variables or a subsystem of your robot, or you might need to represent something that's just too complex and nuanced to be just a string or an integer or a double. And when that happens, objects come in really handy because they basically allow you to create your own custom data structure to represent something that's more complex or more specific than comes with the basic Java package. So when you're creating an object, it will basically have two things. It will have kind of like attributes or qualities about it. And then it will also have behaviors or things that it can do. So for this example, let's just say that I'm making an object to represent a car. So its attributes will be represented by variables. So I might have, you know, a string to represent the color of the car. And I might have an integer to represent how many miles the car has traveled or something like that. And then its behaviors will be represented by methods, which we just covered in the last two videos. So I might have some sort of method which intakes a string. And that will be like a destination for the car or something like that. And what it will do is it will update the number of miles traveled by you know, adding the number of miles from the car's current location to its destination or something like that. And that's just an example. So in robotics, we basically use objects to do two things. The first is that sometimes we need to organize parts of our robot in more manageable ways. So you might create an object to represent a certain subsystem, like you might have a drivetrain object and a shooting subsystem object or something like that. And that allows you to kind of group all of the servos, motors, sensors, et cetera, that are associated with that you know, subsystem into one really easily manageable data structure. It's also just kind of better programming practices to make sure that all of your code is organized and objects really help you do that. And the second situation is sometimes you might be doing some really complex math or some complex methods and you don't want to like have them copy paste it at the end of every autonomous or teleop code you've written. So what you can do is you can take all of your methods and you can kind of group them in an object and use them just to sort of use those methods for each program. That way they're all in one place and they're easy to manage. So to create an object, you need a class. And so a class is sort of like a blueprint or a skeleton for an object. Um, it contains, you know, all the attributes that the object will have, and then it contains all the methods that the object will be able to uh, execute. And so basically, a class is like a blueprint for an object, and an object is an instance of a class. And I know that definition is kind of confusing. If it doesn't make sense right now, that's okay. Java is actually an object-oriented programming language. So classes and objects are pretty fundamental to writing any code in Java, and you've actually been using them this entire time without even realizing it. So the best way to explain it is just to kind of go through some basic sample hardware map and teleop and autonomous programs and just show how you've been using objects and classes the entire time. That way we can better explain, you know, objects, classes, and their relationship between them. So in the context of robotics, pretty much every Java file you create is going to be a class. And probably the best example of this is a hardware map. So right here, I just have the sample pushbot hardware map program um, from first. And let's just run through it really quickly. So up here we have this class declaration, which is public class, the name of the class, and then the curly brackets. And everything inside these brackets is going to be the attributes and the behaviors for the class. And real quick, let's just talk about naming conventions. So when you're naming a class itself, um, you're going to be putting capitals for the first word and then capitals for all subsequent words. But when you're creating like an instance of a class, so basically when you're naming an object or you're naming a variable, then you do it in camel case, which is like this where you have the lowercase for the first word and uppercase for all subsequent words. Um, and this just lets you know anyone who's reading your code know and it lets you know, um, you know this is a class or this is an object or a variable. And so down here we also have the attributes for the class. And in this case, you know the attributes are going to be uh, what, what motors and what servos it has. You're creating a class to represent the hardware for the push bot. And so its attributes are going to be, hey, I have these motors and these servos and you know potentially these sensors, etc. And we just talked about naming conventions. So you might notice that here DC motor and servo are highlighted unlike you know int or double. And that is because DC motor and servo are actually classes. So um, when somebody was writing the code to make the robot controller app work, they actually created a class to represent a DC motor and created a class to represent a servo. So here, when we set these equal to you know actual objects, these are objects, not just variables that we're talking about. 
And so when you have attributes of a class that are objects, it's called aggregation. So you're aggregating those objects into the class. And then beyond the attributes, we also have um, the behaviors, which in this case are the methods for the class. And so probably the best example of that would be this init method right here. So when you create a um, pushbot hardware object, um, you know, down here, obviously you're going to be having this init method. So when you uh, run the init method, it'll execute all of the code down here, which will, you know, get all of the motors and servos and set them to their starting power. And so now I've created this class to represent like the hardware for a pushbot. And like I said earlier, a class is basically just like a template or a blueprint. So what we're doing here is we're basically telling Java and we're telling our robot controller, we're saying, okay, here we have defined basically, this is what pushbots generically look like. Like this is a template for a pushbot. A pushbot has three motors and two servos, you know, motors named left drive, right drive, left arm, and the servos named left claw and right claw. And you know, what can a pushbot do? Well, sort of baseline, a pushbot can initialize all of its hardware. It can, you know, get all of the hardware and set it to the default power and to run with it or without encoders, etc. And so here we basically say, you know, this is what pushbots are. This is what they look like. And then if you go into a teleop or autonomous code where you're using a pushbot, then you go and create a specific pushbot. So here we can say, this is what our pushbot looks like. Like we are creating a specific copy of the template and we're going to name it something and we're going to use it. And that's what we do right here. We say, you know, we start with the type, just like you're defining any variable or object. So we say it's a pushbot hardware. We're going to name it Bob. And we're going to say Bob is a new pushbot and he's just a new blank pushbot hardware object. He's just totally blank. And we're going to name him Bob. And then you can manipulate Bob just like any pushbot. So here we can run his method. We can say Bob.init and that'll reference all the code down in the hardware map. And we can also get all of his attributes. We can mess with all of his motors. So we could say Bob dot um, right drive. That's one of the names of the motors. And we can say dot set power and we can set Bob's power to 50%. We can do the same with the left drive as well. And so basically um, you can put the name of the object and then you can put a dot and then you can uh, reference any of its attributes or the objects that are a part of it. And something else cool is that you can actually create, you know, a bunch of these objects. And as long as you name them different things, then you're totally fine. So I could go ahead and I could say, you know, we have Bob, I'll call this one, you know, just robot. And I could call this one, you know, Bill or something like that. And so now we have three separate push bots. And, you know, right here we set Bob's right and left drive equal to 50% power, but that actually doesn't affect these other two push bot objects that we've created here. So I could go down here and I could set bills, um, or I could just set the robots right drive motor to be, you know, 0.75. And basically since we've created different objects, as long as they're not referencing the same motors, they're kind of individual to each other. So we've created different copies that kind of act all by themselves rather than being sort of referencing one thing. So that pretty much covers the basics of classes and objects in FTC. And pretty much all I wanted to do in this tutorial was give a brief introduction to, you know, what is a class and what is an object. And then to sort of explain, you know, this hardware map program that you've been writing this whole time, that's a class and you create an object from it, which has its own attributes and behaviors. Now you might not fully grasp classes and objects quite yet, and that's totally fine. I don't think anyone really fully understands what they are and the relationship between them just after learning about them. But as you continue to work through classes and objects, either by reading the Java documentation and watching other tutorials, or by just straight up using them in your own code, you'll start to better understand when they're used, why they're used, and the benefits and negatives of using them. So tune in next time when we create a custom class to represent a drivetrain object, and I hope you stay subscribed. Thanks for watching.